Welcome to the, today's uh, colloquium. Today our speaker is from in-house, uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Plowman. And uh, Joe received his PhD in physics from Montana State uh, University. And uh, his thesis actually was on uh, black holes and gravitational waves. Um, but he then moved to, uh, oh, he then worked at uh, Montana State University as a postdoc research associate where you start to do solar physics, I guess. And then uh, came to HAO uh, earlier this year. And he's, uh, um, of course, postdoc visitor uh, with ASP and HAO. And uh, his uh, research interests include the data analysis and the statistics and uh, corona physics, uh, corona heating, corona temperature, and density re reconstruction, which he will talk today. And also his work on comp and uh, corona tomography. Joe? Right. So. Um, as my title says, I'm going to talk about uh, reconstruction of the temperature uh, from coronal data, mainly uh, for this talk at least exclusively using EUV data um, from uh, SDO or Hinode. Um, so it is on. It's just not real. Yeah, let's see if that helps any. Um, so as we all know the uh, visible solar surface is at around 6,000 Kelvin. It's relatively low down. But as you go further up into the sun, you come to a region that's much hotter called the corona and also much more tenuous. And that material is at around a million Kelvin. Um, and it's a real puzzle as to why it's so much hotter than the, the region underneath it. Um, and one of the ways that we can try to understand this is by looking at uh, the spectra of the corona or the corona in different wavelength bands, particularly in EUV, because and part of the reason for that is because the, uh, the disk of the sun is not very bright in EUV, and these hot lines are the, the main thing you see when you look at the sun there. Um, and by looking at these, we, you can get a feel for what the temperatures are and also what material is dense and what material is not dense. And that's because each of these spectral lines or passbands has a temperature response function. It's brightest when material has a, is at a particular temperature or near it. And of course, it's also brighter if it's denser. Um, and these plots show response functions for three of the passbands <coughs> on the AIA instrument on the SDO spacecraft. Um, 171 is relatively low temperature at around a million Kelvin, and it's sensitive to uh, lower lying material and some of these cooler loop structures. Uh, 193 is more intermediate temperature, um, and it's less sensitive to low lying material. Um, but you can still see a lot of the loops in here, and the emission is a little more diffuse as well. Um, and this 335 channel is sensitive to hotter material as well as quite a bit of the cooler stuff, um, and the, the image becomes more diffuse as you look at that. Um, so each of these have, has a different response to the temperature. So by looking at them and comparing them, we can get a feel for uh, what the distribution of temperatures in the material is that we're looking at. Um, and that uh, function, that source function for these instrument response functions is called the differential emission measure. Um, each, the intensity that you see in each of those channels is the integral of the actual solar differential emission measure in any given pixel against the response function of that instrument. Um, and it's basically what you get when you integrate the squared density uh, along the line of sight for all the plasma elements that are at a particular temperature. Um, and this is obviously, this is a useful thing to know because it tells us what, how much material is at one temperature versus another, and so on and so forth. However, it, uh, converting this equation to solve for the DEM is an ill-posed problem, which means that 
uh, because, which means that there isn't a unique solution, even if there's no noise. Um, and that's related to the fact that you're trying to reconstruct a continuous function using uh, a set of a few, uh, say, six or ten um, uh, data points. And the next slide gives an example of this. And this is actually with uh, a number of different spectral lines from ice. It's like 20 or something like that. I can't remember the exact number. Um, and even with a large number of lines, the curves produce identical. These two curves, even though they're quite different, produce exactly the same uh, data values. The observations can't discriminate between them. Um, so you need to, and this is, it, it's, a fun, it's a problem not just because we don't have many data points, but also because the instrument response functions are inherently broad just due to the way the atomic physics works. Um, so in order to actually do these inversions, um, you have to provide some additional constraints. Um, and one constraint that's very well physically motivated and in some situations very useful is positivity. Um, you can't have a negative DEM because that would mean, in principle, you could get negative photons, which wouldn't make any sense. Um, and another constraint you can apply is something like some sort of smoothness, um, which can also be useful, although there's no, not necessarily any guarantee that the solar temperature distribution has very much smoothness to it. Um, and if you choose the constraints wrong, the inversion will be inaccurate. Um, there are a couple of different ways to enforce these kinds of constraints. Uh, if you want to do it in a Bayesian framework, you pose priors on the parameters of that the, say, the Markov chain Monte Carlo is searching. Or if you want to do it in a frequentist framework, you can do something called a regularization. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to be talking about a fast regularized inversion algorithm that we've developed. Um, and I'm also going to show some results from uh, Bayesian inversions for comparison. So first off is a description of the, the algorithm that we've developed. Um, we first compute a first pass DEM that's uh, a linear combination of the instrument response functions. Um, and it turns out that this, for, this minimizes the total squared emission measure while exactly matching the, the input data values. Uh, on top of that, we uh, regularize these um, based on the errors in the data. Um, however, these uh, solutions will still contain some negative emit emission so we also employ an iteration that um, kind of steps through and zeroes the negative emission and then tries to correct the data back using uh, uh, the minimum uh, in terms of emission measure correction and goes back and forth and tries to repeat that until uh, the DEM with the negatives zero matches the, the data within the desired chi-squared. Um, and it turns out that it actually works pretty well. It's conservative about assigning emission measure where the instrument doesn't have much response and it's very fast. Um, on a single core, just running an IDL, we can invert uh, a full set of AIA. Yes? Uh, you haven't said anything, but I assume you removed instrument noise on straight lines. Is that um, specifically removed? Because it doesn't have to be removed. There is a, uh, so I have just run the standard, the standard AIA prep routines, which attempt to correct for most of that. Mm -hmm. Is this an iterative removal? Is the final solution a unique solution? Does it depend on, so, so you come up with, with an initial guess and it has negative portions. Mm -hmm. And then you go through and you start removing the negative portions. Correct. The order in which you do that affects the final solution that you end up with. Um, so 
there's not necessarily a, a unique solution in general to this problem. Um, okay, I, I understand that. I'm saying, does your algorithm produce a unique estimate? For the same set of inputs, i.e., uh, um, data values and error estimates for those data values, the inverse is always the same. The, the algorithm always returns the same inverse. Is that what you're wondering? Yeah, I, I just don't understand exactly what. So, so like, like, like another way to do this would be maximum entropy. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a unique maximum entropy solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't quite understand what unique solution you're finding. What are you optimizing? Um. Hmm. I'm not sure. If there's a, a single simple, like, integral or some other quantity you could define that describes what's being optimized, um, if if the solution is sufficiently smooth and it has a lot of positive um, values such that the iteration isn't necessary, then the then it optimizes for the total squared emission measure to minimize that. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. So I'm going to show a few results from the inversion. The first is a simple log normal distribution. On the left we have the results from our Inversion, and on the right we have the results from kind of the standard Markov chain Monte Carlo code that's used, um, and I would say that they both recover the peak similarly well. Um, there's some, I, I think that the MCMC does a little better out here, um, and there's some other extraneous stuff in this one. Although this is a place where there's not a lot of, the instrument doesn't have a lot of discriminating power. Um, so, in this case, I would say the MCMC does a little better, but it's much slower. Um, it takes on the order of a few seconds to a minute to do this, whereas this takes um, around a millisecond. Um, let's see here. The next example is a multimodal distribution that several log normal distributions added together. And those are ju they're just randomly chosen. Um, and in this case, I think our method actually does better than the MCMC. Um, it recovers the overall envelope of both of the, the main peaks in the data, whereas this one, the, the MCMC gets this one mostly, but the other stuff it, it just doesn't really see. Um, and Part of the reason for that may be that in order to get good inversions, the, uh, the MCMC applies a fairly strong smoothness constraint in its prior. Um, and obviously, that's not really satisfied in this case. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Are your kernels broader than the peaks in your function forms? That's also familiar. Say that again? If the peaks in your D and your input model are broader than the kernels, So maybe this next will kind of uh, So are you worried about recovering broad distributions or narrow ones? Um, okay, so the next slide will probably help there. Um, this is shown in a somewhat different format, but each mm -hmm. vertical slice of this is, an in, is corresponds to a DEM at the temperature on the x-axis, and the vertical slice shows the recovery of the DEM at that temperature. Um, so, and this is this is a very narrow DEM width of. Uh, one part in ten to the minus in ten to the three, um, 
and as you can see, we recover it pretty well. Um, some of the chi-squareds are not that great, just for some data values and some input temperatures. Um, but I think some of the width that's, that's seen here is just due to the inherent uh, broadness of the instrument response, um, rather than any limitation in the reconstruction, per se. Um, Yes, uh, that's true, but remember we're doing this iterative thing, so in principle what, what's most important is... Uh, in the ideal case, it's an identity mechanism. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and a, and yeah. If you're interested, we can uh, talk about it later and stuff. Um, I gave this stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, let me see here. So in summary, I think what we see with both methods is that smooth or well-isolated features can be recovered, uh, but complicated features are not even if you have many channels. Um, however, you can get the overall envelope of these kind of features, um, and if you can do a good job of, for instance, background subtraction to get rid of kind of a broad uh, floor in the in the, uh, the spatial distribution or other kinds of techniques, um, then you can you can do a lot better if you can isolate uh, just the emission from a narrow feature and turn it into something that is basically a delta function. Um, and I think both algorithms work pretty well within these limitations and they give similar results. However, the, the priors or the regularization do inevitably affect them. Um, and you have, to, you have to make some sort of assumption like this in order to make the problem practical because it is uh, an ill-constrained problem. Um, so I think it's important to try to develop more physically motivated priors and they can also influence the reported uncertainties um, even in the, the case of the, the Bayesian reconstruction. Um, so any questions at this point? Yeah. On the uh, example that you were giving, I mm -hmm. didn't follow entirely. You showed several or, or quite a few uh, inversions. Right. What was the difference among each of those? Did you inject random noise? That's correct, yes. Signal. So the solid, solid curves are the in original injected DEM, and each of the kind of the, the dashed. Uh, and does, does your inversion take account of? It does, yeah. So if you put in lower noise, it will try harder to uh, match better to the signal to reach the, the, the chi-squared indicated by the noise. All right, so why is this interesting? Well, one thing it lets you do, and unfortunately, of course, this doesn't show up all that well in the projector, um, is you can um, use it to make pretty temperature maps of the, of the solar corona um, or you can do emission measure maps or some combination thereof. Um, another thing that, that we've been working on that um, tries to, to leverage this technique a little harder is to try to look at the, the heating functions of coronal loops and I've developed a code that allows you to interactively analyze them using ICE and AIA data. Um, I have a kind of a module that does automated co-alignment of ICE rasters. ICE is a, a, a scanning slit spectrograph, so it goes along and grabs a slit. Um, and it takes about a couple of hours to build up a, a full raster image of the sun. So it makes uh, co-alignment more difficult, but if you try to carefully match what you're seeing in both instruments. You can co-align them pretty well. Um, and interactive selection of uh, loops and their foot point coordinates, um, extracting the, loop, the, the selected loops um, and background subtraction. Um, and then we estimate the temperature and density from ICE and AIA. 
and their length just from the, the geometry of where their foot points appear to be and where the selected points along the loops are. Um, and from that, we can compute uh, a scaling factor that for, uh, at least for simple uh, loop heating, strand heating models, indicates where the heating is at, whether it's at the foot points or the midpoint. Um, and it's straightforward enough that an undergraduate can analyze several loops in an hour using this technique. And um, the results are also stored in such a way that I can go back through the, the user selected stuff and repeat the analysis um, using updates to the code or other techniques um, after the fact. Um, so let's see here. The next slide just shows the first of the loops that we looked at. And as is often the case, it all also happens to be the nicest one that we've found so far. So typical results are shown. Um, and let's see here. So this is an image taken on April 19th of 2011. Um, the loop segment that we were looking at is outlined here. On the right is the DEM for that segment after background subtraction. And as you can see, along at least certain parts of the loop, there's still some foreground in there. So background subtraction is still kind of a challenge that um, I'd like to try to work some more on. But um, as you can see, this loop uh, increases in temperature as you go to the right. Um, let's see here, next slide. I have the, uh, the density from ice using background subtraction and the pressure that's computed by combining the AIA data with the ice data, um, just using the ideal gas law. Um, let's see. And the next slide shows the hit, uh, fit to the analytical strand heating distribution. So from this, we estimate the maximum temperature using the the, uh, the predicted heating uh, profile. And from this, um, by combining all the pieces of information that we had before, we find the, the heating rate and also the, uh, the parameter that characterizes the heating, um, which is this alpha here. And as you can see, uh, in this case, the uh, heating appears to be strongly concentrated towards the foot points of the loop. Um, and let's see here, the next two slides just show a couple, other loop, a couple of other loops that we've looked at. This one is interesting primarily because the, the high C rocket image roughly this portion here. Um, and let's see, do, 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 similar story. Um, density and pressure here and temperature. In this case, the, the heating parameter is also strongly concentrated at the foot points. Um, and here we have a third that looks very nice, although still we have difficulty getting a really solid background subtraction uh, temperature distribution. Um, similar plots. And here is fit to the temperature profile for this loop. And this loop actually appears to be even more strongly concentrated at the foot points. So this is my conclusion slide, just a list of stats for the loop. And what we see in each case is that, at least for this, this strand heating model that we're using, uh, foot point heating is strongly preferred um, Joule heating is the most consistent. Other mechanisms don't appear to be consistent with the results. So, future, I'd like to refine the heating model and the loop fitting and also apply the code to a larger number of loops. Um, may make a good RU project. Thank you.
or Joe? Mm -hmm. Is there some easy way to explain why joule heating would give the alpha of minus 1.5? I'm just wondering where that came from. Um, I'm afraid I'm not super familiar with the, the details of the modeling. Um, it's, uh, mainly Pete Martin's part of the work, so. Yes. It's just if the this be applied to some uh, synthetic data from uh, models? Is it to um, I don't see why it couldn't be. You would need to have uh, you know, basically models that give have some realistic physics in kind of the, the density and temperature structure and then give you, uh, let you produce um, synthetic ice and AIA data from those and then you can look at that. Um, tried this for post flare loops. Um, because presumably they might not be showing up as foot point heating. Mm -hmm. I have not. This is an, an obvious. Yeah. Right? I made, what percentage of the loops have been studied have you found that heating the foot point? Um, what fraction? All of the ones that I've looked at have that. What does Bill think of that? Um, I don't think he's like strongly weighed in on it, so he has seen the talk before, but I don't re remember hearing a lot of comments from him, so maybe he wasn't paying very close attention. <laughs> um, the uh, These active regions are all kind of selected because they're pretty static, and they don't change a whole lot over the, the ice observing time, which is kind of the big limitation for this kind of study. Yeah. All right. No more questions? Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm.